Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, really, uh, you know, I always, you know, I appreciate the opportunities, you know, I have to, you know, to be able to share God's word with people and uh, especially look forward to, you know, being at you know, Cross Point Church and being able to, to do that this morning. And, um, and so uh, here's the thing. I mean, think about this. If um, on a scale of one to ten, you know, how would you, you know, how would you, uh, you know, uh, rate your spiritual life, you know, as a, as a one, maybe, uh, you know, uh, you know, like a dry riverbed or on a, or a 10, you know, rivers of, you know, living water, you know, or maybe someplace in between, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, it seems like, you know, sometimes, you know, we spend a whole lot of time, you know, in a dry, thirsty land in a, you know, in a riverbed, you know, when God wants us, you know, to be in those, you know, deep pools of, of living water. And I think, you know, the message this morning is going to kind of encourage us. Jesus, you know, uh, in uh, John chapter 7, this is, this is six months prior to, you know, to Jesus, you know, going to the, to the cross. And he's at the Feast of the Tabernacles. And he stands up on the last day and he says, if anyone thirsts, he says, let him come to me. He says, and drink. He says, he who believes in me, he says, as the scripture has said, he says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, verse this he said, he spoke concerning the Spirit. He says, whom those believing in him would receive. He says, because the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. You know, thank God. You know, we're on this side of the cross. We ain't waiting six months no more. When we believe in Jesus, okay, you know, we have the spirit of the living God living in us. We're going to look at a passage this morning in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3. And Paul is uh, is speaking, you know, about the the Holy Spirit. And I think what's going to encourage us this morning, you know, to be able to move from them, from them dry riverbeds to more experience the depths of, of God's love to experience those living water that he speaks about there in John chapter 7. Let's pray a minute. Heavenly Father, I just, uh, Lord, thankful this morning. I'm thankful, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, to look into your word. I'm thankful, Father, for the opportunity, Lord, just to, Lord, to grasp a little bit more of your reality, to grasp a little bit more of what it means to, Lord, to move from that dry river bed to, to move into those deep pools of water, Lord, your water. So, Father, I just pray, Lord, as we move forward this morning, I just pray for your hand, Lord, just to be upon this time. I pray for your guidance, your direction, for your wisdom, for your discernment, Lord. Open our eyes, Lord, that we might see wondrous things from your law. Deal bountifully with us this morning, Lord. So, Lord, we just thank you and we praise you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. If if you have your Bibles this morning, you can turn to uh, Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to begin in, in verse 14. Um, but before we, uh, before we do that, just to kind of, kind of frame it up a little bit, you know, something a little bit about uh, the Ephesian Christians. You know, Paul was uh, writing this letter to, to, the, to the church in Ephesus. And uh, Ephesus was kind of a messed up place. You know, if you look at, uh, you know, if you go back and read Acts chapter 19, you can kind of see how messed up it really was. I mean, you got, you got sorcery, you got witchcraft, you got, you got uh, idol worship, you got uh, uh, magic, and it's not the kind that you pull the rabbit out of the hat and, and little card tricks and stuff, okay? It was dark. Uh, it was a messed up place, and people were getting saved out of this, all right? And they were coming to faith, all right? And so, and so Paul, you know, writes this letter, you know, to this, to this culture, to this, this group of believers, you know, who have been saved, you know, out of this you know, but they're still, they're still in a kind of a dry riverbed. Paul wanting to move into, into them living pools of water that Jesus spoke about in John chapter 7 that those believing in him would receive. Sometimes, you know, we wonder how come we're in a dry riverbed. How come we ain't experiencing those, those deep waters? Paul gives us an idea here how to start to move forward and in that reality and how to start to experience those deep pools of living water. Paul starts out, he says, for this reason, I bow my knees, he says, to the Father 
of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. One of the things that we got to kind of get, you know, is, is the reality that Paul's writing this. One of the themes that's going through Ephesians is the, is the inclusion of Gentile believers now into God's redemptive plan. The gospel first came to, to Jews. Jesus was a Jew. All right, but then it spread out. Right? It's coming to Gentiles. That's us. Okay, we're Gentiles. Okay? And so Paul, he says, for this reason, all right, that, that, that now Gentiles are being included in God's redemptive plan. Early in, in, in Ephesians, in chapter 1, Paul writes in, in, verse, in verse 13, he says, In him you also, speaking of Gentiles, in him you also trusted. He says, after you heard the word of truth, he says, the gospel of your salvation. They heard that Jesus died for them. Died for their sins, was dead, buried, raised again. They heard that gospel. They knew life wasn't working out so well the way they were doing it. All the sorcery, all the magic, all the idol worship, and all that other stuff that the world wants to, you know, to kind of get us going in that direction wasn't working out so well for them. They were in a real dry and thirsty land. He says that they were sealed. He says that they were sealed with the Holy Spirit when they believed, when they trusted in Christ Jesus. Sealed with the Holy Spirit. In chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2, he says, And you, he says, he made alive, speaking of Gentiles again. And you, speaking of Gentiles, he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. He says, in which you once walked, he says, according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit, he says, that's still at work in the sons of disobedience. Verse 2.10, he says, but now, but now, he says, you are his workmanship. You are his workmanship. You've been created, been created in Christ Jesus, created in Christ Jesus, he says, for good works, which God has prepared beforehand. He says that you should walk in them. Gentiles now included in God's redemptive plan. Sometimes, you know, it's hard to, to fathom, you know, how, how big God is. You know, we, we sing about it a lot sometimes, but, you know, do we, do we really grasp, you know, how big God is? God says that, uh, you know, in, in chapter 1, he says that they were chosen before time began, that they should be in Christ Jesus. He had predestined them to the adoption now as sons by Christ Jesus, to the praise of his glory. Here's what I believe. You know, you can, you can debate all day long, you know, what predestination means, you know, how God has chosen and all those things, those nice theological debates. Here's what I believe. Here's what I believe. I believe that each person here this morning I was predestined before time began to be in his son and to be right here at this moment for his purpose. I believe it. You know, because I believe God's that big. I can't, I can't fathom it. Everybody made decisions this morning to get out of bed, made decisions you're doing, you know, come to church. Uh, but God foreordained it. I believe it before the time began that we should be right here at this moment for this time. I know it. So for this reason, for this reason, I... God's redemptive plan now includes Gentiles. Thank God. He says, for this reason, we bow. He says, I bow my knees, he says, to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Speaking of praying for these believers. When I see what uh, you know, Paul praying about, 
always try to pay attention. Paul had prayed earlier in, in, in chapter 1. He prays now here and, you know, in, uh, in chapter 3. He plays in Philippians. You know, I always, I always look at Paul's prayers because I figure, you know, if Paul praying about it, you know, maybe I ought to think about it myself. He says, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. From whom, he says, the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That he may grant to you, that he may grant to you according to the riches of his glory. To be strengthened with might through his spirit. Strengthened with might through his spirit. How does one get strong? If I want to get physically strong, what do I do? I work out. I work out. Oh, if I want to build some mass and build some strength, you know, I might grab a hold of some weights. I'll pump a little iron. Might consider eating right. And one, of the, one of the best things I ever did here lately was I listened to John. He said, you need a little bit more protein. So I took up a little bit more protein. I got a little stronger. I get a little rest. Make sure I get enough rest. I want to be strong physically. How do we get strong spiritually? I work out. I pray. I read God's word. All right? I read. I read. I read. All right? I study. I study. I memorize. All right? Because I want it implanted. I want it ingrained. I want it instilled. Obedience. All right? You can know God's word inside and out, upside and down, but it ain't doing no good unless you step out and live it out. See, I want to be strong. See, I spend a lot of time, you know, I like, you know, exercise. I've been doing it, you know, for 40-some years, you know. I, you know, I kind of look back 40-some years ago, and I kind of seen 64 coming. I want to be strong. You know, see, the thing is, you know, this physical body ain't work, you know, ain't holding up so well these days. I still work at it, but I know it's wearing out. But the good news is, you know, you know, I ain't never going to wear out inside. All right, I can always get stronger. I ain't never going to be completely there. All right, there's always room for more. I guarantee you, I'll never be as strong as I want to be. All right, but I keep working at it. And I keep working at it. All right. Because I want to be strong in the Lord. One of the things that uh, Paul would say later on in Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 6, he said, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, he says. One of the first things that he says, what that armor looks like, he says, gird your waist with truth. Jesus in John chapter 17, he says in verse 17, he says, your word is truth. Set them apart by your truth. I can't emphasize that enough. One of the best things I did, you know, 30-some 30 some, 30 some years ago when I started seeing God intervening and moving in my life and my circumstances, I just wanted to know God more and more and more and more. I grab a hold of his word. Back then, I... I'd start in Matthew and I'd go to Revelation. I'd start at Matthew, go to Revelation. Start at Matthew, go to Revelation. A lot of things I didn't understand, but I kept going from Matthew to Revelation, Matthew to Revelation. But every time I did, something else would jump off of that page and latch on to me. I said, wow, how in the world can you do this, God? See, I want to be strong, strengthened through a spirit in the inner man. It just don't happen. I got to learn to say no to this world. That's what the Ephesians had to say. They had to say no to this world. They were getting saved out of a mess. They were a mess. Guess what? We're all a mess. But I'm being strengthened through a spirit in the inner man as I step forward, as I latch on to God's word, as I pray through these things. Asking God to strengthen me, to help me, to enable me. 
Verse 17 says, he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Strengthen with might through his spirit that Christ may dwell in your hearts. That word dwell is kind of an interesting word. It kind of, it kind of gives us the, it gives the impression that, you know, that Christ might feel at home, all right, in your heart, okay? All right, you know, that he might settle down, all right, and feel at home in your heart. See, the more and more that I'm strengthened through a spirit in the inner man, the more that Christ starts to feel at home in my heart. John chapter 14. Jesus was, Jesus was preparing the disciples. Jesus was preparing the disciples for the reality, all right, that he wasn't going to physically be with them anymore. This is his last night. As he prepares us, we don't have a physical Jesus, but we got something better. Jesus begins in, in uh, verse 15 of chapter 14. He says, if you love me, he says, if you love me, he says, keep my commandments. He says, I'll pray the Father and I'll give you another helper. Why is that? Because you know you can't do it. He's going to give you a helper to help you to do that. I'll pray the Father and he'll give you a helper who will abide with you, he says, forever. The spirit of truth, he says, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. He says, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus says, I ain't leaving you out there orphaned. I ain't leaving you orphaned. He says, I will come to you. How does he do that? By means of, by power of, the Spirit of God living in us. He didn't leave us out there and just say, do the best you can. I'm going to be gone tomorrow, but just do the best you can. He gave us a helper. Verse 19, he says, he says in a little while, he says, and the world's going to see me no more. But he says, but you'll see me. He said, because I live, he says, you will live also at that day. At that day, he says, you will know that I am in the Father, and you and me, and I in you. Speaking of that mystical union that we have in Christ. Then he says, he who has my commandments. Get this now. This is neat stuff. He says, he who has my commandments. All right, keeps, and he says, it's him who loves me. Now get this. He says, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Manifest myself to him. Now Judas, not the Iscariot, not the one that betrayed him, Judas says, well, how in the world are you going to do that, Jesus? How in the world are you going to manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus says, Jesus says, he says, he says, he who loves me is going to keep my word, going to keep my word, and my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Powerful stuff. The more and more I experience, the more and more I step forward, you know, and, you know, and strive, you know, to live God's word out, I as ugly as it looks sometimes, all right? I ain't so good at it sometimes, but I'm striving to do it, live it out by his strength, his power, his might. Guess what? You want to experience the reality of the risen Christ in your life? All right, do something you know you can't do, and you learn to trust him, trust his power, trust his strength, all right? And guess what? Jesus starts to dwell 
I have to be at home in your heart by faith. In Ephesians, in, in uh, chapter 3, the second part of uh, verse 17, it says that you, he says that you being rooted and grounded in love, you being rooted and grounded in love. One of the things that Paul uh, speaks about in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, he says that uh, when we believed, when we trusted in Christ, he says that the Holy Spirit now has poured out the love of God in our hearts. So I trusted Christ as my Savior. His love I, was poured out. I've been rooted and grounded in that love. But then Paul says in verse 18, he says in E.T., he says that we might be able, that we might be able now to start to comprehend. It's there. I, I need to start to comprehend it. It's the, the word there probably means more to apprehend it. That I might be able to apprehend the width, the length, the depth, the height. That I might be able to start to get this stuff more and more and more and more. Here's the thing. I can't wrap my brain. I can't wrap my brain around the great love with which God loved us. I can't. How in the world can that be? All right, that God sent his only son to die on a cross 2,000 years ago on my behalf that I might have the forgiveness of sins, that I might have everlasting life. I might start to be able to experience life as God has intended it to be because he's now reconciled me back into a right relationship with him. Blows my mind. But he wants us to know, he wants us to know the love of Christ. He wants us to be able to know that love experientially. God never did care so much about how much you got packed in your brain there about stuff. He wants us to know the thing experientially. He wants us to step forward and experience the reality of that love. As more and more we comprehend, the more and more we grasp the riches of his grace toward us in Christ Jesus, start to grasp the great love with which he loved us, guess what? We're a little bit more equipped now to love others. A little bit more able now to start to grasp, you know, what it means now. For that love. Sometimes we, in our Western way of thinking, we think of uh, love as, you know, some kind of warm, fuzzy feeling. It ain't the love that's been poured out in our hearts. It's a sacrificial love. It's a love that impels us to do the things that we don't necessarily want to do because it's the right thing to do. Jesus says, says you know, he says, love your enemies. I have a hard enough time loving my neighbor next door. But the love of God impels me to strive, to live that out, to exercise it, to trust God, to trust his spirit, to be strengthened, to be able to do those things, because I can't do it. But Jesus, living in me, can Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not boasty. All right? It ain't prideful. It ain't arrogant. All right? It suffers long. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. Thinks no evil. That's the kind of love that's been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Paul says that we might be filled, he says, with all the fullness of God. That we might be filled with all the fullness of God. That word filled means to pervade, you know, means to, you know, to saturate, it means to control. 
think about this, you know, have you ever been filled with fear? Have you ever been filled with worry? Have you ever been filled with anxiety? Those things that, you know, in a negative sense, you know, can cripple and keep us from moving forward and stuff. In a positive sense, you know, God wants us to be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul in, in Colossians says that, uh, that it pleased God that in Jesus all the fullness dwells. In 1.19 and 2, in 2.9 he says, you know, that all the fullness of God dwells in him bodily and that we're complete in him because Jesus is the head of all principality and power. Verse 20 says that God is able. God is able. God is able, he says, to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. According to the power, the power that works in us. To him be the glory in the church, he says, by Jesus Christ, to all generations, forever and ever. World without end. Amen. What you praying for these days? John in the in chapter 14, right before the you know the passage that we just looked at, Jesus says, uh, he says, if you ask anything, he says, in, in my name. Ask anything, he says, in my name. He says, I'll do it. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. Then in John chapter 15, he says kind of the same thing. He says, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. And again, he says, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much Fruit. Here's the thing. There's some things I know that when you pray, God's going to answer. Right, He's going to grant. I know it. See, when I'm asking, when I'm asking God to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man, when I'm asking that Christ might dwell in my heart through faith, that I might start to grasp the width and the length and the depth and the knowledge of Christ Jesus, that I might be filled with all the fullness of God. See, all the divine attributes, all the divine qualities dwell in Christ Jesus, and he's in you. He's in you. That's why I can do those things. That's why I believe, you know, that God will do those things. Because he's able. He's able. God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Well, I pray something along those lines that Paul just prayed right there. I know God's going to answer it. If you're asking for a fish, he ain't going to give you a rock. Guaranteed. There's a lot of things I pray for. I don't know exactly what God's will is. But here's one prayer right here. And I don't have to tack on in Jesus' name. Because it is in Jesus' name. While I'm praying for those things, God likes the answer in those kind of prayers. To be strengthened with might through his spirit that Christ might dwell richly in you, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God, that that love, Lord, might be more and more exhibited in everything that you do and everything that you think. Here's what I know. I'm tired, I'm tired of living in dry riverbanks. I want to live in those deep pools of living water. 
That's where I want to be. And I'm praying for those things every day. And I don't quit. Jesus says, ask, and you'll you receive. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and it'll be opened. Those verbs in the Greek are present tense. It's action ongoing. I keep on asking. I keep on seeking, and I keep on knocking because I don't want to dwell in a dry river bed. I want to live in the pools of living water that Jesus, Jesus promised in John chapter 7. Cross Point Church. Move out of the dry river beds. Move toward those living pools of water. In Jesus' name. God bless you and have a good day.